this is just incredible. Um, <laughs> I'm just, just thinking about the, the last time I came to the Albert Hall was to see Sting. <laughs> and, um, and I remember, you know, you had to park three miles away like most of you probably did. And um, I was walking with my friend Jan, who's up here somewhere. And uh, I remember walking here thinking, gosh, can you imagine? I said to him, gosh, can you imagine all these people are going to see him? And um, you've all come to see us now. Um, I'm just that if there are dedicated Star Trek fans anywhere, they're here in England, and we're all just... Okay, I'll tell you what, um, let's do photos now, and then, um, you know, and then all take a picture, and then, you know, we'll stop, because I'm being going blind, basically, you know, and I'll probably fall off the stage at some point and embarrass myself. And, you know, there'll be a photo with headlines in the sun tomorrow saying something like, you know, Councillor Troy with her legs in the air. <laughs> you know, I uh, you know, won't mention the convention, you know, so let's do photos now, and then, and then when I tell you to stop, you stop, okay? All right, okay, wait a second, I've got to put the mic down somewhere. Question and well, not request as such, but 
I've got to post my daughter here, and in your honour, we called her Diana Marina. Oh, you. thank you. So, would you like to accept the question? Yes, I will. Thank you very much. And also, the question is, how do you feel when parents call their children after you? Um, <laughs> well, let me just get this. Okay, I can't bend down too far because that's too short. By the way, can I just ask you something? You can't. Congratulations. Well, I'm glad you called her Deanna Marina, because hopefully she'll take after Deanna. Um, if you ask my mum, you know, she'd say, God forbid there would be another Marina on this earth. But um, I'm always very flattered. I mean, I think it's like the ultimate flattery. Um, you know, like seeing people dressed up as you and having gorgeous little babies named after you. I think it's the biggest compliment you can get. So thank you very much. Thank you. I've got a look for the likes, haven't I? Okay. Up there, okay. Hi, Marina. Blind as a bat, yes. <laughs> um, I know the crowd's getting a bit sick of this, but I just wondered if you could just please make my best friend's lifetime. No. Oh, kiss. Where is he? Over there. He's just, his name is Matt. Matt, in this direction, vaguely. Yeah. Over okay. there. I was wondering about your feelings about the family being a female captain of the USS Voyager. My feelings about there being a female captain? Okay, well, I do have to be honest. I think it should have been me. Um... <laughs> Trek. You know, if it had gone on for 20 years, I'd have been on it. You know, it was like the best thing that ever happened to me. So um, I was a bit sad that they, you know, they kind of decided that they didn't want to use any of us. But it works, I suppose, because they're lost, aren't they? Aren't they? Really? So um, I suppose if we could find them, they could find their way home and there wouldn't be a series anymore. So um, no, I, I think it's great. I think. You know, as Star Trek's evolved over the years, we've seen women's roles getting much better and stronger, and uh, finally there's a female captain. And, and the amazing thing is, of course, in America, that it's been accepted. You know, they're not up in arms like they were when Major was cast as number one, you know, in the pilot. And, and NBC said, oh, no, no, no one will ever accept having a female, you know, in that position. So we have come a long way, and Kate is fabulous. Have, you, have any of you seen it? She's really, really good, so um, I think she'll be uh, another great captain like we've had, you know, all the way through. Yes? Yeah, and um, I'd just like to say that, um, why did you move from London to America? Why did I move from London to America? I, th I think my agent probably wants to hear the answer to this too, she's here as well. Um, why did I move? Well, basically, um, I just got it into my head that if you, if you wanted to be kind of really successful as an actor, that that's where you had to go. And so um, I just said, like, one day, okay, I'm going to go to America. And I told all my friends so that, you know, I had to go. I couldn't try to change my mind. So um, I just went, got on a plane and went. And, of course, it was about, it was like the wisest move I ever made. Uh, but I wouldn't say it's the best place for English people to be, but it is, it is if, you know, if you want to be an actor. Do you want to be an actor? Uh, not particularly. Oh, really? <laughs> Why not? <laughs> you can't be bothered, oh, it's all right. <laughs> well, what, 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 like, I'm not getting up in front of 5,000 people. Um, and what do you want to do? Be a pilot. Be a pilot? Well, that's much better. Okay, well, hope, good luck. Good luck. <laughs> yes. Uh, oh, yeah, it's on now. Good afternoon, Marina. Good afternoon. Great to see you back in London. Um, my favourite Star Trek episode was Face of the Enemy, which had a great performance from yourself and Caroline Seymour. Thank you. Um, in the 
But that was a good example of how in the last three years of Star Trek, Deanna Troy became a very strong and interesting character. Oh, you mean she was but boring before that, didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> Girl, come all the way back on to be insulted. Thank you very much. <laughs> yes. And I wondered if the character development of her was something you yourself had pushed, or whether it was something which came about because of the writers of Star Trek. Um, I think the writers have to be given total credit for it. Um, basically, um, I turned up for work, about 10 minutes late usually, but I turned up for work knowing my lines generally and um, hit my mark and tried not to bump into the furniture. Um, and that was my contribution, really. Um, the writers uh, decided, I suppose, that they wanted to kind of do more with the character, and uh, that usually comes from the fans. That usually, you know, things change on TV shows because they get responses, either one way or the other. So when they saw that, obviously, people wanted to see more of Deanna, then that's what started happening. Um, Face of the Enemy, actually, did turn out to be one, probably my favorite episode, because finally we saw that Deanna <coughs> could actually be tough, you know, and, you know, like strong, and uh, when she wasn't being possessed by an entity. <laughs> um, so uh, I was really happy. And also the director on that was a British woman too, Gabrielle Beaumont. So it was like the girly team on that episode. Uh, I actually, when I filmed that, you don't really realise about different costumes and different <coughs> aliens until you actually have to be one. And ever since I was a Romulan, I have renamed Romulus. It's the bad hair, bad clothes planet. <laughs> Because it's like, okay, well, do Romulan hairdressers only learn one hairstyle? <laughs> or does their hair only grow to that length and then stop? And why do they need those, like, Linda Evans shoulder pads? You know? And why do they need to wear wellies on the inside when it's not raining? You know? It becomes a whole big different thing because you have to start negotiating doorways and things and going in sideways because you don't fit. My, my other favourite, I think, is The Child, which was way, way, way back when I was still a teen. Um, so, uh, yeah, I was really happy with her development towards the end. I still think there are a few unanswered questions, though. I mean, like, what is her programme on the holodeck? I think the producers didn't want to touch that one, actually. They got a bit scared of that one. Yes. Hi. Hi. I'm Rita. Um, just what I'd like to say, You've got the best legs in Starfleet. <laughs> oh, I was going to say you haven't seen Patrick's, but you probably have. Right? <laughs> and what was your first reaction when you found out that Major Bella was going to play your mother? What was my first reaction when I found out that Major was going to be my mum? Okay, um, terror, actually. Because um, I have to give you a bit of background on her mum. And um, it's, uh, it's a really, really, we have a really great friendship. So uh, I'm one of the best things that happened on the show. Light, light. Over here, Marina. Over there. Hello, Marina. Hello. I see from your biography that you're in Rep down at Worthing. Yes. Played Ophelia. Who played your Hamlet? I can't um, remember. How long ago was it? Chris something. Yes. Yes. I saw it. You saw it? Yes. Yeah. Was that good? Yes, as far as I remember, oh. yes. <laughs> you know, they said it's a tougher crowd in London. <laughs> uh, it, was a, it was a good rep. Season. Yes, it was. Oh, so did you see anything else in that season? Oh. Oh, so French Without season. Tears. Probably. Jane Eyre. Yeah. Yes. Oh, yes. so you saw all my stuff. That was done. Downhill after that for a few years, but... Um, and then it picked up. <laughs> yes. Good. Well, thank you. Nice to see you again. Nice to see you. Thank you. Uh, hi, Marina. Hello. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank you for, uh, in behalf of, on behalf of all of us, I guess, for uh, seven wonderful years of uh, Next Generation. And You're not English, are you? <laughs> You're not English, are you? Hmm? You're not British, are you? No, I'm not. Where are you from? I'm from Holland. Holland? Yeah. Okay. Welcome. Uh, what I would like to ask is, uh, what are your plans uh, on uh, the Mist of Avalon? I know you have uh, uh, well, I'm to do part of yes, uh, 
game. game yeah. Yes. Um, I read the Mr. Babylon years ago and actually reread it again recently. I, I don't know if you've read it. It's a really fantastic book about the Camelot era. Um, or the Arthurian legend, I suppose. Um, last I heard, James Coburn had the rights. But having reread it again, I can't imagine how much money it would cost to make that into a feature film. And actually, you couldn't squeeze it all into two hours. So maybe one day it will get made into a miniseries, but um, I will be banging on the doors of the people who are casting it. Yeah, um, it's, it's my favourite. That's like my ambition to play that part. Okay? Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah. Here. 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 No, I don't get a say in what I wear at all, actually. 
actually. Um, and of course, uh, they were tight. And I, I think I've said before that the, uh, the only good thing about Star Trek ending was that I could breathe out after seven years. It, it, was, it was hard because you can't, you know, put on, well I did, I kind of did put on an ounce or two, but uh, anything else, and you know, you can't wear the outfit. But I have to admit, I used to have like the big outfits, you know, and the smaller outfits. Like most girls have two wardrobes, don't they? You know, when you're thin and then when you're not thin. So, um, Troy at time had two wardrobes too. Um, my favorite, my favorite outfit, um, for a, a, a peculiar reason actually, was the green dress. It was my second favorite outfit actually, because the underwear was so fantastic. I had to wear a corset, because, not because I had to be held in, but because in the 24th century, we are wrinkle free. Which is why all the boys do the Picard maneuver. The other thing, I don't know, you know how the corsets work, girls. They push everything either up or down, right? Well, what was pushed down was obviously hidden under that swirly skirt. And what was pushed up was enclosed in what I have called the industrial strength Starfleet regulation rosier. <laughs> because <clears throat> every woman on Star Trek now wears this bra. I mean, not the same bra, we've got more than one, you know. <laughs> They would see me coming in as me in the morning, you know, and then they'd see me two hours later as Troy. And they would go, <coughs> I want a bra like that. <laughs> Adds inches, you know. Saves you a fortune in cosmetic surgery, you know. Of course, it is depressing at the end of the day when you take it off. You know, you kind of go. <laughs> where they go, you know, but um, it was great for the underwear. My personal favourite uniform, though, was the regulation space suit that I wore at the end. Um, of course, in Hollywood, there are certain rules. One of the rules is that um, if, if women have a cleavage, you know, they can't have a brain. So when Troy got a cleavage, all her brain matter went south, you know, and she was decorative for a while. Potted palm on the bridge, you know. Um, but of course, when she got her spacesuit, you know, the regulation oh, spacesuit. No, I haven't finished yet, shut up. Um, <laughs> when she got her spacesuit back on, she got her brains back, you see. And so in episodes like, let me think, Timescape, have you seen that? Okay, in Timescape, okay, wasn't the greatest episode in the world, you know, but as far as I was concerned, it was like a landmark episode because Troy got to say things like, that's impossible. The Romulans use an artificial singularity as their power source. Right? Okay, okay, right. It took me, it took me three weeks to learn that line. But I said it. And who did I say it to? Geordie and Data. Right. Actually, when we were shooting the scene, I actually did a little sneaky look to either side to make sure that they hadn't developed a cleavage while I wasn't looking. You know. um,
things in art that um, our writers just saw Beauty and the Beast once too many times. Um, I, actually, I actually don't, I could never understand why that happened. I did always have in my heart the hope that Troy and Riker would get together, you know, finally. Um, we, we, we actually, Jonathan and I were plugging for a long time a sequel to, to Star Trek, you know, The Next Generation, before we knew about DS9 and Voyager. We thought the next, you know, series should be The Rikers in Space. <laughs> a wacky half-hour situation comedy, you know, and we'd actually talk to Brent and he said, you know, Zany Uncle Data would come and visit every now and again. Um, I don't know, I mean, this whole thing between Troy and Wolf I found very disturbing. I mean, I thought we had established very early on in, in the series that, um, how can I put this, you know, in mixed company, that um, a human female wasn't um, adequate for a Klingon male, didn't we? Um, of course, I said this to Michael Dorn, who basically had been trying to get his lips on mine for seven years. Um, I said, you know, it doesn't make sense, Michael. And he said, well, you know, you're not all human, you're half Betazoid. And I said, oh, yes, well, I just wasn't aware it was that half, that's all. <laughs> start shooting them. But I, I, I suppose that the Troy Wolf thing might continue. I was a bit concerned about the fact that she was dead in the last episode. <laughs> yeah, that was a worry, you know. <laughs> but of course it doesn't matter if you die on Star Trek. We killed Denise twice and she still came back. <laughs> We met Patrick Stewart yesterday, and uh, he rambled on for quite a long time. <laughs> he, he did what? Rambled on. He rambled on, did he? Yes, Am he did. I rambling? Oh, um, no. Okay, fine. Very okay. interesting. Oh, thank you. Um, I was just wondering, why the hell are you called Mighty Mouth? Why am I called... Oh, no. Oh, all right. Oh, all right. Yeah, yeah, he calls me Marina the Mouth, yes. Well, that's because I tell you the truth. You see, they tell you the stuff that they think you want to hear, you know, because they want you to like them. <laughs> you know. They, you know, I've always had this reputation, and I get in trouble, actually, I do get in a lot of trouble, because I do tell you the truth. Um, because I really don't care if you like me or not, you know. Um, <laughs> no, that's not true, but uh, I do in America. But... Um, <laughs> No, it's not like you're all coming to my house tomorrow, you know. But uh, that's why it's because I tell little secrets about people that they don't want, you know, you to know. Oh, man. Well, you have to. You, know, you have no, it's like you have to be. There, you know, general dirt, like there isn't much on, apart from the fact that you know Michael Dorn can get a girl's phone number in like ten seconds. <laughs> you know, it's like he can go from hello to a lunch date. You know, in ten minutes, he's he's a bit of a you know flirt. Um, it's putting it nicely, isn't it? Um, it's funny. At the uh, party, this big bash party we had after the premiere, I spotted her. You know, as soon as I walked in, I said, "There she is. There she is. That's the one. You'll be chatting her up by the end of the evening." You know, <laughs> and of course, I was right. <laughs> oh, hi, me. <laughs> is it the that you played in the Rocky Horror Picture Show. Rocky Horror Show. I'm not old Rocky enough to have been show, in the yeah. movie. Okay. Yes. Um, would you love to do something like that again in the future time? I'd love to do. Uh, the Rocky Horror Show, I kind of regard as my training for Star Trek. Because we... <laughs> yeah. Because we went to Munich, and in Munich, it was like the Beatles had arrived. We got... We, we were all these young, unknown 
noticed the word young, unknown, British actors, got off the plane, and then like, photographers and reporters and all these strange people dressed up as Frankenfurter, you know. And we were, what's going on? <laughs> there he is, that's him. <laughs> and, um, so, of course, the girls instantly, it was like, <gasps> press, where's my makeup? And um, we were greeted by throngs of people and played to 3,000 people every night. And um, I don't know if I can still do the time warp, actually. <laughs> I can't remember it, I can't remember it. It was a long time ago. Step, right, move to the right, look left. Hand on hips. Right. terribly well but I do love doing them, they're the most fun but yes I mean I I, uh, I love being on stage and so um, actually that's why I'm the convention queen of the next generation this I am because uh, it's like my live applause you know fix really it's like I'm, you know yeah yeah it's great so um, live theatre is, is what I love the best so hopefully if I if I'm in the plane here will you come and see it Hi, Marina. Hi. Love the suit. Thank you. Um, I was just wondering, were you slightly disappointed that you didn't have a really big part in all the things since it was the last episode of the series? Um, was I disappointed? <clears throat> no, actually. Um, I think it was such a good script. You know, when we read the script, we thought this is such a great story um, that everyone was like really excited about filming it. And yeah, of course. Every actor wants to be in everything the most, you know, so um, there is always that feeling. But like I said, I thought the script was so great, and, and when I saw it, you know, Patrick was just so fantastic. Plus, I'd done that aging thing before, and it's like really horrible. So I didn't mind not being, you know, 80 or whatever it was in the end, because I hate wearing prosthetic makeup. So, uh, no, I wasn't. I got some time off actually. Because I don't have to go into work when I'm not in the scene, you know, so I actually was able to do some stuff. So, no, not at all. Yes? Hi, Marina. Hi. What's your most embarrassing moment since you actually started working on Star Trek? Most embarrassing moment? There are several. <laughs> um, okay, when we were shooting, you know, Generations, um, in the explosion, you know, that happened, um, the girl that was, you know, when the girl that was driving got exploded and Riker said, you know, take the wheel or whatever it is on the Enterprise, Troy. <laughs> what is it? The helm, right? Take the helm, you know. <laughs> well, I don't know, you know, take whatever. And I rushed forward and I sat down and my chair was on fire. <laughs> Cut, Marina, what's the matter? I said, my bloody chair's on fire. I've got a hole in my spacesuit. So, of course, he said, OK, well, we've got to do it again because of you, you know. And doing it again didn't mean just let's do it again. They kind of had to put everything back together again, you know, and set all the explosives again. And so three hours <coughs> later, you know, take two. So Riker said, Troy, take the helm. And I rushed forward and I thought, well, I'm not doing this again. And I wiped the chair down. <laughs> to 
a naked Klingon in that stuff, you know. No. <laughs> it's not an owl, it's a ew, because, you know, don't ask me why he had that stupid grin on his face the whole scene. <laughs> So that goes down as the most unpleasant experience. Yes. Hello, Marina. Hello. Um, you're a favourite <coughs> one. Um, Thank you. I've got one question. Do you really like chocolate? <laughs> <laughs> I could have been allergic to the stuff for all they knew, but um, no, they, I, I actually do like it. I can't eat as much chocolate as Deanna seems to. I mean, it's like that's all she eats, and she's like never gains a pound, so I don't quite know how that works. Maybe we've got like body replicators or something, you just get in and they can. Kind of... <laughs> but yes, I do. I like, I like plain chocolate though. So when, I, when they gave me milk chop to, chocolate to eat, I'd spit it out. <laughs> it was very, very ladylike to put me to a bucket, you know, <laughs> by the side. Yes. Hello. Hello. Hi, Marina. I was actually going to ask that question. Oops. <laughs> well, can you think on your feet and sing the fingers on the answer? Yes, I okay. um, I actually read the book, Anzardi, because I was so intrigued by this relationship that went on before the actual series started. And then I listened to the tape, which was narrated by Jonathan Frakes. So yes. Have you ever heard his impression of you on that tape? <laughs> Actually, it's probably good for him that I haven't, really. <laughs> And so phrases that I say in life, they, they've now it's come, become, become part of their vocabulary, like, hang on. <laughs> no, hello. Well, what am I, chopped liver? You know. Um... But going back to the book, I think you have to remember that the books are written as, oh, excuse this, but as a separate entity to the TV show series and the movies, which is why Will Riker has a different middle name in, um, in the book than he had in the series. Um, something happened once, uh, the writer who wrote Anxiety, Peter David, oh she's just gone out, um, Peter David, uh, I've had a, a meeting with him once at a convention and you know I basically you know tell jokes and stuff like that and I said to him, and this was a joke, but you know, Troy and Mike, Troy and uh, Wolf didn't get on for a few years. If you noticed, they didn't like, you know, really like each other, and that was because um, during the, the filming of the child, you know, Troy was convinced that Wolf wanted to eat her baby, <laughs> and he put it in the book. So you have to be careful what you say, you know. <laughs> yes. Hi, Marina. Hi. Can you be honest with us. Uh, while you were working instead of Generations, did you? Sense any hostility between uh, Patrick Stewart and William Shatner? Um, not at all, actually. I didn't, and to be honest, I kind of have to take Patrick's word for this, and I, ne and I never actually saw them working together. If you noticed, I wasn't in those scenes with them two, you know. I know. So, um, I actually never did see them, but I'll, I'll tell you why you mustn't believe what you read. <coughs> Apparently, in the papers here and in the tabloids in America, it said that Bill and I had had a fight because of something about the movie. And the first time I saw Bill in connection with Generations was at the premiere on Thursday. So um, it wasn't Friday. true. Friday. Friday. Well, yes, fine. Yes, it was Friday, I guess. I've lost count, I don't know where I am, what I'm doing. I've lost count of the days since I've been, I've been so busy. But it was, um, they make things up. When there's no bad news, they'll make it up. They don't, you know, it's not interesting to the press to hear that people get on well with each other. Uh, you know, no one's going to read that, so if they can't find any dirt, they'll just make it up. So when you are reading those, you know, specific papers, just bear that in mind, will you? Okay? Thank you. Oh, up in the golds, hello, up in the ashtrays up there, yes, hello. Hi, Marina. Hello. Um, I read, well, I didn't really read, but... <laughs> <laughs> 
best something to do. <laughs> Why did you decide to change your uniform from the standard one to the one in the sixth and seventh season? It wasn't my decision. Um, basically, we shot an episode called Chain of Command, and that Captain Jellicoe person, who we didn't like, you know, said to Troy, you have to wear a space suit. And so she gave him a dirty look, but she went and put one on. You know, it's like, well, if she's had one for six years, why didn't she wear it before? You know, but you don't ask those kind of questions. So she went and put it on, and Basically, the producers watched that, I think, and said, hang on, she looks good in that. Why hasn't she been wearing that for the last six years? And saved us thousands of dollars in costumes, you know. Um, so what they decided was that when I was on duty, well, I think they decided because, like, letters started to come in, you know, from the boys, who went into cleavage withdrawal, you know. <laughs> When she was on duty, you know, she would be in her spacesuit, and when she was off duty, she would wear one of the other, you know, other outfits, and then everyone would be happy. Um, of course, the one place I used to wear the other thing was um, in the poker game, and that was always one of my, <laughs> one of the biggest questions I ever had about Deanna was, why the hell is she in the poker game? <laughs> She's an empath! <laughs> to the big screen, or do you think there were more adventures that you could have continued on on the small screen? Um, as, as far as my character goes, I think we, we could have, like, explored her a bit more, you know. Um. <laughs> <laughs> I can see him, I can see him. There are children in the audience, you know. It is Sunday, all right. Get a grip, all right? All right. <laughs> Whether you thought that the Enterprise could have gone on? Oh, yes, could have gone on longer, yes, yes. Um, yes, of course, I, like I said at the beginning, I would never have left the show, you know, so if it had gone on for 11 or 12 years, you know, I would have been on it 20 years, it would have been Troy and a walker, you know. Um, but uh, I think it was the right decision. It was time for an, a, another Star Trek movie, and I suppose we were, you know, the natural candidates <coughs> to kind of pass the baton on to. I know that's really bad grammar, forgive me, the English teachers out there. Um, but, uh, I mean, no, I mean, I was sad that it was over. I was really, really sad. I I'm very good friends with Terry Farrell on DS9. And, oh, yeah, yeah. She's, she's great. And I didn't really kind of, kind of, it didn't really sink in, if you like, um, that the show was over. Because when we finished the movie, I mean, I had three days off in between, you know, the series and the movie. And then when we finished the movie, it would have been our summer holiday anyway, what they call the hiatus. Sounds like some kind of, like, operation, doesn't it? Um, but they call it hiatus in America. Um, it, was, it was only when, at the end of the summer, Terry went back to work, and I didn't, you know, that it really hit me that it was over. And it was a very hard time. I have to be honest, um, especially when I was having lunch with a friend of mine who still works at Paramount, and they have those like electric gates where you've got a little card, you know, and you put it in front of a red light and the gate opens and you drive in. And I went back to the studio and my card didn't work. <laughs> I've been locked out. But the people on the gate know me, so I just drive in that way. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So, um, it was sad, yes. Um, I read that when you first 
auditioned for Star Trek The Next Generation, you auditioned for Tash and Yar. What were your feelings when they gave you the part of Deanna Troy? Well, my feelings were, scrape me off the ceiling, first of all. Um, I was so happy. I actually was glad that I got the part of, of Deanna because I thought she was really interesting. And she got all the emotional stuff to do, which, of course, as an actor, that's what you want. Um, the only good thing, if I had been cast as Tasha, was that I would have been Michael Dawn's boss for seven years. <laughs> and that would have drove him crazy. You know? um, but no, I really, really liked Troy. I thought she was a really wonderful person. She's so kind of good, you know. Um, it was a stretch, as you can tell. Um, <laughs> the, thing that, the thing that confused me... The thing that... Hello, what? The thing that confused me was that... Um, the accent thing. Because when I was auditioning for Tasha, uh, she was supposed to be from Eastern Europe, you see. So I was doing this kind of vaguely Eastern European accent for the auditions. And then when I got the job, they said, well, you know, you can't be British. Because the captain's British. You know, and he's more important than you. <laughs> yeah. And at the time, because I was just so grateful, you know, to have the job, I didn't like to say, well, why the hell should I do an accent? He's supposed to be French. <laughs> but of course, being British, you know, and looking at Star Trek over the years, I was actually, I shouldn't say this, but quite delighted to find that by the 24th century, there are no more French-speaking people left in France. Um, yeah, I can't do that one in Canada. Um, can't do that one on that side either. Uh, so I, I couldn't actually ever figure out when we heard about the tunnel being built, you know, over, over in America. It's like, why? <laughs> They don't like them, we don't, you know, they don't like us, we don't like them. What are we doing? Joining, joining each other up, you know, together. And then I realised, of course, in Star Trek history, it's because you basically go over there and take over and infiltrate and do all that stuff. And, you know,
best time of my life. The worst time was back in 1971 when Arsenal had to beat Spurs to win the championship at White Hart Lane. And then they went on to win the cup and they did the double, and they did. Yes, I'll oh, Actually, I completely got myself beaten up that night, I do have to say, because there was an Arsenal fan just walking past me, and I have been known to just snap, I suppose. And as he walked past me, he went, we won the league at Spurs! And he was wearing this hat, and I just, like, ripped it off his head and started stamping on it. Um, and then looked up, and to quote Data, went, oh, shit. to the loo and didn't come out for like an hour, you know, um, so uh, I, I did do that again, yes. Hello Marina. Hello. Uh, first of all, you've got some front talking about Romulan haircuts, do you remember the first season? <laughs> I mean, it got better after that. Oh well, thank you very much. Yes, I remember Bunhead. <laughs> Denise used to hate Bunhead because, of course, I, you know, even standing on boxes and wearing five-inch heels, I was still the shortest person on the Enterprise, and Denise would always have to stand behind me, and the bun would cast a shadow on her face, you know. <laughs> so, um, I was very glad to see the back of her, actually. It was like, if you've watched French and Saunders when they do that ballet dancer skit, I actually felt like it was, you know, pinned into my head. Uh, it was horrible. But, uh... Yeah, I have a question for you. Okay, you do? Uh, oh, okay. I've Not just enough read... to insult me. No. Uh, I've just read Jean Roddenberry's autobiography, like many people, uh, obviously, you hold him in awe. Um, but you can get nothing from a book, really. I've always wanted to ask somebody that knew the man, if you could just give me a little ditty, something about Jean, and I can think of no better person I'd like to ask than you. Okay, thank you. Ditty about Jean. Well, apart from being, you know, a genius, a visionary, you know, um, basically probably the brightest man I ever met, um, one of the nicest. Um, the, only, yeah, the thing that immediately comes to mind was, I don't know if you know about the cruises that they have over here. If you ever hear about them, you really should go on them because you, basically it's a ship, you know, a cruise ship, and it's a, it's a convention on a ship. So the only escape for the actors really is over the side. <laughs> So if you want to meet the people, this is what to do. Um, and we were on a cruise, um, the Roddenberry were on a cruise, and we were on, in the cabin opposite. And I remember um, Gene sitting, he was in a wheelchair by then, which was a shame, and he was in a wheelchair, but it was like spirit, spirit wasn't to be daunted. He just kind of, I was walking, I went into a drink, sorry, with them, and um, he kind of grabbed hold of me, sat me on his lap, and said, give us a kiss. <laughs> In front of Major, you know, and I'm like, get off, get off. Um, but he was, he was really a fun person. Um, I still get really um, choked up about the fact that he's gone, because um, I had like a double, double whammy, if you like, when he died, because my dad had died like 10 years earlier, almost to the day. And so I was like, you know, upset about that. And then we heard the news about Jean, and um, I was devastated. Uh, it was such a shock. But I do have to say, the only thing I can think of really is that it's, I know that you would, I suppose, pay anything to be in the position of being able to say he was a really good friend. I know him really well, and I loved him. You know, and that's all I can say really. Oh, thank you. 
to take Skilagi to work with me if, if there was going to be nobody at home and I knew that I was going to be at work for 15 hours, you know, that day. So I would take him to work. I mean, he was really, really good, you know, really very good actually about, you know, not making a noise and stuff like that. Except one day, I think it was early on, I was in a scene that Brent wasn't in. So I went to Brent and I said, you know, Brent, Skilagi doesn't really like being locked up in my trailer when I'm not there. Would you mind kind of babysitting, you know, while I go off and do this scene? He said, yeah, yeah, just bring him to my trailer. You know. So I took him, you know, to Uncle Brent's trailer. <laughs> Strict instructions, you know, don't do a whoopsie on Uncle Brent's carpet. You know. And then, you know, I left him about 20 minutes later, I'm coming back. And because, you know, I don't have children, so this is my child substitute, I'm running to the to the trail, I'm like, Skilagi, because Troy runs like this, and it's just Skilagi, Skilagi, it's mommy. And I get to the door of Brent's trailer, and he's putting Skilagi into the microwave. <laughs> so I haven't left him with Uncle Brent since. <laughs> Now, I don't know, has American football taken off here at all? You know, right? Yeah. Well, there was another time, actually, I would sometimes take Skilagi to the set with me. Um, and he was usually very good about, you know, business things. Um, except in one episode, in Sub Rosa, I don't know if you've seen that, have you? Okay. In, in the cemetery. Well, you know, well, he thought he was outside. <laughs> Stuff, you know? <laughs> and then, then he did actually go and do a number two. You know, exactly where Gates was supposed to be standing. <laughs> and I didn't, think, I didn't really think I could say to her, that's your mark, you know. Um, <laughs> and then there was another time I took him onto the bridge. And um, the boys have this thing about my dog. They pretend to hate him. I, I, I choose to believe that they pretend to hate him. Um, and usually, you know, they're kind of really mean to him or pretend to be mean. And, and Michael Dawn's always going, to pretending to kick him, stupid dog. You know, it's like a rat. <laughs> my husband says he's a Coke can with hair on. Um, but, uh, but I took him onto the bridge one day, and for once, Jonathan was like, really being sweet to him. Actually, Jonathan was the best out of all of them, I do have to say. Jonathan was being really, really sweet to him, like, picked him up. He's like, going, hi, Skilladi, it's Uncle Johnny. And I'm like, you know, oh, that nice. And, and he, we were standing by the view screen, and Michael Dawn was standing, you know, at his station on the whole show. <laughs> and then I turned my back for, you know, 10 seconds, and the next thing I hear is, Michael Dawn! Just do not mix, obviously. <laughs> yes? Hello, Marina. Um, I'm a big fan of yours. Thank you. And before I ask a question, and I, say, I love the accent you've created for Deanna Troy. Thank you. We listen to it for hours. And, um, <laughs> Does that mean you hate this accent? No, 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 no. It's very, it's very genuine. Um, I'd like to say that during the first season, uh, you were just decoration. You were fantastic. Oh, thank you. And you've got a great range. the other cast members or any of the other directors who worked on the show, but Jonathan Frakes is the best director we've ever had on the show. Um, as brilliant as an actor as 
he is, he's even more brilliant as a director. And he, he's very, he's a, rare in as much as everybody loves him so much they would like, you know, walk on glass for him. So um, it, it's just a special atmosphere when he's directing. And as far as my favorite moment, gosh, there are so many. Um, what? No! Not Devanoni. What was his name? Ram Lal. He was horrible. <laughs> it, it didn't make sense to me that, you know, Troy was like really good. Well, semi, semi good. You know, for years. And then this thing came along and she fell head over heels in love with him. I didn't get it. You know, it's like, it's a bit of a lox, really. You know, lox means smoked salmon. American, but it doesn't translate into English. Um, so, a bit, bit of a, you know, I didn't like him particularly. Um, no, so that wasn't my favourite moment, probably one of my least favourites. I can't think. Probably, um, oh, I know what my favourite moment was. Telling that bloke I was going to eject him into space. That was my favourite moment. I liked that the most. And, and then having the baby and the child, they're my two favourite. Yes. Good afternoon, Marina. How are you? Hi, good. Splendid. Um, first of all, let me just uh, provide my sincere condolences to the fact that you are a Spurs supporter. I know it's not. I have to say this. Um, you, you're, actually, I have to tell you, I'm actually living, I'm staying with friends who actually live on the same road as the Arsenal. And they have threatened me with death. If I so much as put anything blue and white up in the window. So, um, I, but I did try, I was on my way out, I was on my way out on Wednesday night when you were playing AC Milan, and they, they walked down the middle of the street down there. I did try and run a few over, but they got out of the way. Yes. I was just wondering your opinion, I mean, obviously, because you've been away for so long, your opinion on the British football moment, for example, the Eric Cantona and Paul Merson. Well, I don't, I don't the um, Cantona thing, um, and I have, to, I have to say, my brother was a footballer, um, he hung up his boots last year, he played out in Greece, and the things that the players, you know, have to listen to, you know, some of the things that I've yelled to them on occasion, I suppose. Um, um, well, it varied, West Ham, Chelsea, I wasn't picky, you know. Um, but. Um, I suppose it must be really hard to to kind of keep your temper, you know. Um, I don't think you can condone like physical violence. I didn't actually see the incident. I don't know if you, I mean I know you kind of did a kung fu kick at him, is what I heard. I'm not sure. Did he actually connect? Yeah. Oh, he did. Yeah. Oh, he's very fit. Um, <laughs> oh, he did, did he? Oh. Yeah. That, I, that's a little bit silly, only in as much as you know you're not going to get away with it. You're going to get banned or <laughs> suspended and a fine. So it doesn't actually make a lot of sense as far as your career goes. But I can, being a hot-blooded person myself, I can quite understand how somebody do. Sometimes you might want to, like, you know, bonk on somebody. Yeah. So I don't know. I, I have mixed feelings about it, to be honest, because the crowds have a lot to be desired sometimes. Yes. Hello, Marina. Hi. Just wondering, if and when you get a chance to do some more stage work, what would you most like to do? Oh. Uh, I suppose anything in the West End, really. It's like, I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not one of those actors that say, oh, you know, I only want to be in films, because you get a lot of that in America. I only want to do features. Um, my opinion is that I was actually in one of the most one of the best quality television shows ever for seven years. And, and I, you know, I have, I have made in my career some pretty bad movies, you know. Hey. <laughs> yeah. um, he, um, he's seen them, yeah. Um, and if it was a choice between doing, you know, good television or good theatre or whatever, as opposed to bad movies, I'd do the, uh, the former all the time. But um, I suppose being, a classically trained actress, I'd have to say, you know, the classics, I'd love to do more Shakespearean roles and some of those Greek roles, you know, um, ones that spring to mind, I suppose, like Kate and Taming of the Shrew, a bit old for Juliet now, I suppose. Are you supposed to say no at that? No! <laughs> um, the classics, I suppose. Yes. Hi, Marina. Welcome Hi. back. Thank you.
I'd just like to ask you a question about Genesis. Um, in Genesis, you played a part where you had a line based down the water for quite some time. Yes, I was an amphibian. Uh -huh. uh, how did just that feel? you didn't realise. I wasn't a fish. I was an amphibian. How did that feel? <laughs> it was wet, obviously. Um, <laughs> as I said, I hate to wear prosthetic makeup, so um, it was like the double thing of prosthetic makeup, soggy, you know, so it was really horrible. Um, but I thought, I, I, I was actually not going to complain about anything on that show because finally, you know, one of the girls got to direct and I was going to put myself behind Gates 100%. So whatever I felt, I just kept quiet about it, you know. And um, I actually think it turned out very, very well. Am I melting or what? What's going on? <laughs> Is this a sign? Is this a sign that I'm finished? Is it about to... Oh, hello, Simon. All right. Okay, well then I'll just wind, I'll just wind down. Um, before I go, I just want to say um, thank you. Uh, there, are, there are very, well, there aren't any fans in the history of show business who are as loyal as Star Trek fans. And basically, um, the reason, no, 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 the reason, the reason that the next generation happened was because the Star Trek fans watched reruns for over 20 years and made it a viable proposition for Paramount to make Star Trek The Next Generation. And as I said before, I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for the best seven years of my life. I want to thank you for my house, <laughs> for my car, the clothes that I'm wearing. Everything I have, I owe to you. Um, I will never ever forget. I don't know what's going to happen to The Next Generation in the future. You know, I'm not the right person to ask. But whatever happens, I will never forget just how much we owe to you. Thank you for watching for seven years.